This is the Unearthing Art Podcast with Michelle Luminato and Beck Lee, where we dig into the messy reality of making art that matters, raw and real conversations about being an artist, navigating the creative process, and expressing our honest and sometimes weird selves. In our last episode, Michelle, you were giving me some very valuable coaching because I was having a a moment, not just one moment, many moments of indecision and trying to work out what would be the next best step for me to take in the studio with something that I was trying to achieve and some techniques I was trying to get a handle on. And towards the end of that conversation, we came to the topic of trust because we were talking about how there's no one wrong or right answer to these kind of challenges and problems and puzzles that we come up against in the studio. Sometimes you need to step back and widen the lens of your perspective on it. Sometimes you need to kind of double down, you say, you know, go into it and and zoom in and just keep going, even though you're really not sure this is the right thing to be doing. And that, oh, it seems really counterintuitive to me. So Mm. it seemed to me that you were working a lot on kind of trusting the moment, trusting yourself. I don't know. We thought we could talk a bit more about trust and and what role that plays in your art practice. Yeah, I I definitely think, especially looking back on earlier stages where I probably didn't trust myself as much. Um, And so I think there was a lot more stop and start because of that as well. In terms of just, you know, do I do this? No, do this, go over here, do this. Like, and not necessarily following through with things completely. Because I think what happens when we pick a path, like if we're looking at something and we're trying to solve something, we, we pick a path and we're like, is this the right path? And of course, because there's uncertainty in the studio mm. and we're looking for a guarantee for that right path. I think we want a guarantee. I think that's true for all of us. Like you just, you'd feel a little bit smarter and safer about your decision. I mean, as, as adults, I think we go through life trying to make like smart decisions because, you know, we've learned from our mistakes. I mean, I think one of the things about age is that you have a lot of mistakes behind you. And I think... We're constantly trying to avoid the mistakes. And in art, I don't think it actually works that way where you can avoid mistakes. And I think right. that's the part of the trust part where I, I think I really was looking for like, well, how do I make it perfect? How do I avoid the mistake? How do I get to that like best solution without any problems? The idea that you troll back through your mind and go, okay, last time I did this, this happened and that happened. So therefore I want to like do it the same way, or I want to change this to avoid that. And you're saying it's not necessarily predictable in the same way. You can't reapply the exact same lessons, especially when, as we've talked about a lot, the whole process of art making is exploratory like the whole point Mm -hmm. kind of in a way is that you're breaking new ground or walking a different path yeah each time trusting that even when you go down this path that's full of uncertainty and maybe you end up with something you don't like or maybe you end up with a process that you don't want to use right now it I haven't found that it's all a waste it might just Mm. be that that particular application or that thing doesn't work in that moment but maybe it will be used down the road or in a different context. And I think that's where trusting yourself that, I don't know, maybe this is me and more of my philosophy of how it all connects together. But I Mm -hmm. think there's a little bit of trust that things start connecting, things start making sense, even in that moment when it feels like, is this something that's going to be useful right now? And I think because we're in that a little bit of an instant gratification moment of, you know, we want that effort to be useful right now or it doesn't count. And then if it doesn't count, our brain is like, well, can you trust yourself to do that again next time? Exactly. That's what I'm thinking about. How do we build that kind of trust? I'm wondering, do you feel like there was time, there was certain things that happened or practices 
where you developed that did it just yeah. come naturally over time in the studio again this is where it, it seems pretty ordinary but i think that the repetition of surprising yourself regularly mm -hmm. and letting those mistakes come through regularly has actually allowed me to trust myself more so what i'm saying and i want to make sure that that was said is the more mistakes i make the more i trust myself Mm -hmm. which sounds completely not really the right way it should be done, right? The the more I give up that I'm going to make it the right way, I'm just going to go in and make something. It may be a mistake in that moment because I've given these, these conditions. I wanted to do this and I wanted to do this. And of course, art surprises us and it doesn't. It does something different. And so the more I kind of let go of that expectation, the more... The more I find that it actually does work somewhere. Doesn't sound like it makes logical sense, but yeah. It kind of does. It's almost like uh, changing the, the meaning of it or what the expectation around what trust means, let's say. Mm. So mm -hmm. having trust in yourself and in the process isn't about trusting that it's going to work out perfectly or trusting no. that you're going to get it right. It's almost like an acceptance, could you say, that, yep. that that's not the case. And I think it's interesting that you're saying the more repetition there is, it's demonstrating to yourself that <laughs> it's demonstrating that like you're not going to die if it's a mistake <laughs> or that yeah. something terrible is not going to happen. Yes. So you can trust that it'll be okay yeah. you'll get up the next day and and do it again so there's a trust in your commitment to it um, yeah. and I can imagine that all of those things like you know commitment to showing up trust that you'll keep showing up that if something goes wrong you're not gonna throw in the towel and I can imagine how that repetition is so much more effective than say an example you know not describing anyone in particular but an example <laughs> where you may instead of just showing up and doing it and and having that repetition spend a lot of time avoiding doing the thing and worrying about whether or not it's going to work out which is only going to reinforce the that you can't the trust, trust issues yeah, yeah that you can't do it because yeah. there's no evidence to the contrary and it's yes. kind of building that story yeah. yeah so finding the creating i was about to say finding the evidence that that you can rely on yourself to to continue in the studio but it's mm -hmm. not just finding the evidence but creating the evidence yourself You're like okay i'm gonna leave a uh, an evidence trail for myself so that like when future me looks back and thinks, oh, I'm not feeling sure about this thing in the studio, whether I should go on even though I'm unsure, uncertain, um, uncomfortable. And they go, what's the trail of evidence? Oh, I've, I've shown up and done these uncomfortable things for quite yeah. a while now. So I'm just going to keep, it's almost taking the charge out of it. Like it doesn't, it's not such a, it feels like it's not such a big deal for you. Is, yes. Is, is that yes. accurate? I would say so. And I think... I think the other thing is when you start to let go of controlling, you mm -hmm. know, the art and letting, I always think like in my art anyway, it has such an opinion of its own. I know that sounds a bit silly because art seems to be, you know, this pile of material things like paint and substrates and stuff. But I find that if I can really respond to what's happening with it and let it have a say, there's less resistance and it, it somehow ends up working in a weird way, even though it completely did not hit my expectation. Mm -hmm. And I think that what happens is then we have this pool of stuff, the stuff we've learned from, the stuff that might be like maybe, you know, some studies that you have that maybe you don't yeah. want to pursue now, but maybe... In six months, you're like, oh my gosh, those are the best things. Where have they been? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I think yeah. we we can, the more we can detach as well from what happens in that moment, mm -hmm. making it mean that you're good or you're bad or this is useful or it's not, 
Yeah, it's yeah. it's just an experience. And I know that sounds like I waste a lot of time in the studio, but I actually don't. I used to think that way. I used to think, oh my gosh, is this going to be useful? I'm under a deadline. Like, especially if, if you've given yourself a, you know, fake deadline or a real deadline and you're under pressure, you know. Yeah, yeah. That is the quickest way to kill my whole studio practice is to put myself under pressure. So staying as loose and detached to my experiences is the part that again I'm trusting that it will work out Mm -hmm. even though you know so there's a lot of trust where the more and this is just evidence that I've seen by doing this is the more I try to control it the more I try to literally force it to be something and then Mm -hmm. it comes out differently that it's just it's it literally like me banging my head against a brick wall. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think there's a little bit of trust in the process itself and trusting that I have this relationship with art and it's kind mm. of a two-way relationship. And in two-way relationships, it's got to have a voice. It's yeah. It's got to respond to what I say. <laughs> and then I got to respond back. Mm. So that- I think that's fascinating thinking about it like a relationship because it brings in a, as you've touched on there, a whole lot of different dimensions in relation to trust and how you relate to the, to what you're doing and the process. So for me, what I first thought of, it means that it's not all up to you. So yeah. instead of in, in this idea of trust doesn't become, I trust in myself that I'm going to somehow muscle through and work this all out and get it right it's a it's a partnership it's a conversation and so you're kind of putting trust in the art to show up as well yeah and yeah and to give which back. sounds kind of weird I guess but I find that it works better that way there's less resistance yeah. and yeah. there's clues it it literally and I I just think that art is a very energetic thing it's kind of like this circular thing where you know, we put the art out, it's energy flowing out, it, it comes out, and then that energy literally comes back into us. And mm-hmm. so it's like this kind of give and take process. And yeah. the more I get comfortable with that, and the more I'm like, hey, what do you want to be? <laughs> you know, yeah. which sounds a little silly. I just find that it shows up for me in a, in a more or less resistant way, I should say, in a, in yeah. a way that um, is fl- more flowing. And yeah, there's trust yeah. in that, I guess. Again, it's that trust. And the tighter I squeeze, the tighter I, you know, like get upset when it when it's like, you're not doing what I want you to do. You're being difficult. You're being hard. You know, and I get annoyed. I feel like the art's on the other end going, yeah, and so. like, <laughs> <laughs> It definitely feels more collaborative to me. And mm. I know what you're saying, talking in this way can sound a little strange, But compared, if you flip it the other way and think, well, if I think of myself as an artist who's going through the world completely non-collaboratively, so Mm. I don't respond to anything else, everything is on me. It's all on my shoulders to kind of generate it internally and execute it and come up with everything myself then you could see how, as you say, that can lead you to become very controlling and also how limiting. It it becomes a smaller worldview, like in the studio, Mm -hmm. you're there and you're very closed in and you're like, I don't have any resources. All I have is like what I'm going to physically sort of uh, make happen with my pure will. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you think of creative collaborators all around you in terms of inspiration and the art and the information you know flowing back and forth that does feel a lot more like full of possibility and, and less, pressure. less pressure yeah <laughs> I, I'm like when you when you describe like the weight of the world of like gotta solve this all and you know I've got to control it and not only do I need to control it but I need to control it right this moment every single time like uh-huh. <clears throat> I just get really wound up in my stomach even thinking about that which is what I used to do it was just I think it was that trying too hard trying to will it into something you know that you kind of think you have an idea of, but you actually don't. 
you know, mm. and then when it disappoints you because you thought you wanted it to be this one way. And it's just, to me, felt like it was always setting myself up for disappointment mm-hmm. as well as, um, as I just think it was pretty crappy stuff. <laughs> like it was, <laughs> it was not my best stuff. I feel like my best stuff is when I go in and have an intention of an experiment. I trust that even if it doesn't work out in this one moment in the way I imagine it, that somehow mm. there'll be useful information out of that or yeah. it will be useful in another way. And I think it's really interesting to kind of restate in a slightly different way what you said before. It's almost like a um, transition from thinking of trust as in, like you were saying, trusting that it's going to work out. But I think actually it's almost like you made a transition to trusting that whatever the outcome, that you're okay and you're yeah. still going to be an artist tomorrow and you're still going to be an yeah. artist the day after that. Yeah. Rather than feeling like your sense of possibility and I guess identity and path as an artist is like on the line (laughs) every day. Again, we come back to pressure, don't we? I am great at pulling out those pressure points and saying, Yeah, let's put more pressure on that. Let's make let's let's increase the stakes. I think that's another part of the studio (laughs) process. You want to decrease the stakes. Is that fair? Totally. I mean, as much as I am a serious artist, like the more serious I get, the less serious I get. It's full of (laughs) contradictions, even though like my intention is to be a serious artist. I don't take myself too seriously in the studio. And the reality is, I just find that with materials, paints, you know, brushes, even if you really are skilled at something, you're surprised by the humidity, the weather, you know, the the paint may be a little bit dried out. Like there's just conditions that you really yeah. don't have control over. And to not be a little flexible with those conditions, I think is very unrealistic. You could look at it as a kind of a hubris or <laughs> sort of thinking a bit too much of yourself if you think that it's it really is all on you because all those variables are going to come yeah. in and have some impact on what's happening moment yeah. to moment. Things that have nothing to do with you that, as you say, have to do with the weather and the materials and what's yeah. happening here or there. Yeah. Yeah. And I do remember, you know, in the earlier days of being a painter, um, I think that because creatively there were some other things that I felt, you know, that I had disappointed myself with. So maybe I didn't have that trust coming into being a painter, you know, mm. of, of maybe finishing projects or whatever it is. And so I think we kind of bring baggage into being a painter that we assume that being a painter is going to be very much similar to something else we've done. Mm, and Or not done. Or, or not, not done. Yeah. And so it's that trust of, you know, like, for instance, say someone didn't go to art school and maybe they're like, well, I don't know if I can trust myself to be a painter and learn how to be a painter because I didn't go to art school. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that might be one example. I was creatively really bored in some other industry projects that I was doing. And so I didn't know if I could trust myself to commit to painting as a like stick with it as a painter. So that was something that I came in with as a trust issue for myself. And the only way that I really overcame that was repetition and showing up for myself, even when it sucked. Even when it was like no signs of progress in the way that I wanted, you know? That sounds super challenging. Yeah, but I think (laughs) that the the thing there was I knew that I wanted it bad. I knew that this was something that was in my soul. I was really moved by painting, um, Mm. partly because I always felt like it healed my soul and it was a little bit of an adventure. Like there was a lot of things that painting was doing for me. And Mm. so... I was not willing to give that up, you know? And so once I kind of reconciled, like, well, this is it. This is it. This I'm going to be a painter and kind of cross that line. I think that was when I started going, you know, I didn't consciously go, okay, you got to trust yourself now. You know, it, it didn't <laughs> yeah, happen yeah. like that. It was more of just keep showing up, keep showing up, and keep commitment. showing up. It's almost like, well, there is no other way. Yeah. Like there isn't going to be anything else. I'm tempted to ask you 
as a follow-up from that, was it a, a gut feeling that gave you that? Like, how is it different from, how do you not think, oh, what if I wake up one day and I feel about painting the same way I felt about that design work or that stationary business or that thing that I just, yeah. I felt really empty about at the time? Good, super good question. And I do think about that a lot. And one of the things that I realized as a painter, um, somehow along the way, I don't know what at what point, but I realized that I could actually have a say in that. Mm-hmm. I could turn it into something I didn't care about if I didn't stay connected to it. Right. Or I could literally get invested into how connected I was to it. And it was literally, mm-hmm. I remember feeling like there was a, a path, like a, a fork in the road where it was like, are you going to go this way? You're going to go this way because lots of I, the, lots of opportunities come in your way. You could go this way, would work. This over here, you have no clue what you're doing. This connected mm-hmm. thing, you don't know what it looks like. It looks pretty messy. It doesn't look like, honestly, the fork was super um, scary in that sense mm-hmm. because being that I can create commercial products, I, I could see how I could do that. But I also knew that that would sell a little bit of my soul. And that was the part that would change painting for me. So you had that experience in the past and you're like, okay, you could kind of sense down that maybe more like, commercial or felt more dependable or reliable in some ways. You're yeah. like, no, but also down that way could be the burnout the yep. boredom it could really sour that relationship totally. that we're talking about it's a two-way to- thing again like you yeah. have to be it's almost Somewhat like you have protective. to be willing and willing to i'm not quite sure of the words that i'm searching for but there's something there about investing in the relationship like yep. that you don't it, it's not going to be a hundred percent guaranteed you have to take risks i think that's what i'm struggling yes, with. I'm so unfamiliar yes. with that word <laughs> you like, know it's saying yeah. if you want the really quality relationship and you want to protect that relationship so that it stays really rich and equal and give and take yeah then i'm going to take the risk and go down this way rather than go for mm-hmm. something that might feel better to me but I kind of have a sense that it's not going to feel better for the art in the end and so once the art yeah. loses out then I'm going to lose out because we're yeah, kind of symbiotic totally. absolutely 100 percent. and it is something that I still think about because I think that um especially when it does give you something you know the art making process feeds your soul Mm -hmm. and it and it it maybe heals you in some way it just like it does something for me and Mm. there has never been any other creative adventure that I've done that has has done that for me I mean I've had Mm. lots of creative projects that are you know successful or not successful but there's nothing that's really felt that good in the heart and the soul you know yeah and so I'm quite protective of that but I have to say the that fork in the road felt more like a cliff (laughs) that I was Mm -hmm. jumping off of you know it was like I don't know where the I don't know what the bottom looks like I don't even know how high I am on the cliff but I knew if I didn't do that I'd be so disappointed and Mm -hmm. uh and guess what disappointment would lead to I would be not trusting myself again yep yep it strikes me suddenly (laughs) and maybe it seems obvious listening to this conversation but all of a sudden I kind of have a different perspective that what we've been talking about how we started out which is like you know how do I build this trust in myself we talked about uh controlling like you Mm -hmm. have to let go of control and this idea that actually maybe what an element of it is is building trust in something else in the art in the external creative collaborators which means letting go of control and that and giving over control to something Mm -hmm. else Mm -hmm. i think what i'm getting at is that sometimes we can learn through experiences in life that it's important to be really self-sufficient and to be able that everything that we need we should be able to give ourselves Mm. and so we feel this calling towards art and we start to practice these 
creative things and like you have said before art is the biggest self-development journey yeah so you feel this calling and you start to have this feedback it feels great but you haven't maybe fully realized that part of that calling is it's it's kind of calling you to open up as a person yes be less self-sufficient be less in control of the situation because to fully realize what's trying to come out it's not just about being in yourself and trusting yourself to take care of everything and muscle through it's actually about relinquishing and trusting in something that you have no control over yeah and that can be (laughs) super scary yeah yeah definitely and I think um and that's why for me the repetition of mm. getting in the studio to do something you know it's yeah. it's more important to do the repetition to practice the the letting go and i really do think yeah. that the journey for me has been from complete control freak i mean complete i mean not that i'm not or i'm still a recovering <laughs> control freak but <laughs> i think that i've learned to really relinquish a lot of that control more than i used mm-hmm. to Mm. And it's it's a practice, though, and it's a daily practice. One day you're great at it, and the next day you're really terrible at it. I'm saying mm. you're, I'm saying me. It's funny the way that some days, you know, your emotional wave and roller coaster is supporting you, and other days it's not. But mm-hmm. that's life. That's life being, you know, having a human experience. So <clears throat> I think really recognizing how much control we really have over being human (laughs) that's an element there talk about you've got human experiences you've got materials you've got all these considerations like to to think that we can control all of it is actually Mm. a little bit funny because yes it's like unless you're you know some superwoman which i can't think of anyone humanly you know here i just think that it's it's more useful to be more open you know and so some you probably heard me say i sit in silence sometimes or i sit you know in meditation Mm. and that is because i really want to let my guard down i really Mm. want to take out everything that's ticking in my brain coming up Mm -hmm. with these little ideas and it's already giving me this little controlled plan you know like do this do this do this yeah yeah you know And, and, and and coming up with the answers Yep. Sitting in silence kind of, or meditation, meditation music works really good for me. It lets me stop thinking and just kind of, I always feel like it's kind of opening up new things that are coming from more than me. You know, it's just this Mm -hmm. energetic thing that's happening. Learning to trust that more is also something I've gone through in the last few years in particular, the last two to three years. I was always used to, you know, really being in the driver's seat and really, you know, tackling it like locked in, locked locked and loaded. This is a project. This is a thing. And now I'm like sitting in nothing coming into the studio with like, it sounds like I'm doing nothing, you know? Yeah. So it's so super contrary. You're contrasting that with being very locked and loaded planned. You know, do you find um, now that you allow time to be more open-ended like you don't Mm -hmm. sort of set you're not fixed into particular ideas of when something's going to be done or not done by yeah I think for me um especially if I'm working on a collection you know that I'm really working towards finishing Mm. I do kind of give myself like well let's experiment for an hour you know it's Mm -hmm. more of a time block thing for me where I want to maybe look at something that I hadn't really done. Like yesterday, I literally at the end of the, I went in for just a few hours, and the last 10, 15 minutes, I just sat down and started sketching some shapes um, mm. based on what I was seeing in my inspiration boards because I was just kind of like trying to recall, like, what am I seeing? What am I looking at? What do I? What am I interested in? And sketches are nothing. Like they're literally like you know not useful in the here's what I'm going to do next. They're more Mm. just an observation sketch. But I definitely am more free-flowing of, hey, it just feels like I need to do that right this second, and I'm going to do that, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't planned. It just was like, felt like a good time to do it. I grabbed my sketchbook and just 
did it. I don't know if I answered your question there, but... Well, I've seen you working with artists, you know, being involved in conversations yeah. with multiple artists where, and I really relate to this as well, where they feel a certain amount of anxiety that something's not happening, that, you know, completed work is not happening fast enough yes yes (laughs) whatever that means you know that they're they're finding themselves doing preparatory work or investigative work in the studio over and over and and they have that worry about but you know why am I not posting something I'm not posting something on Instagram I'm not making completed things and I know that I've seen you kind of try and reassure people and say take the time take the time but at the same time I'm really I really relate also to the anxiety of saying I've taken so much time if I take any more time you know it's not it's not happening fast enough especially in lockdown I took a lot of time to really not move forward but Mm -hmm. it was more of a yeah I'm just gonna sit here I'm just like as in I was just gonna stew in because I, I had passed the fork in the road that I had just described. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I'm jumping off the deep end. What does a deep end look like? Well, if I go fast, it's going to look like the other fork in the road. So right. I think that it's more around mm-hmm. looking at really what is the goal? What's the vision? What do you want? Do you want to just do it because you f- feel like you're supposed to do it? You know, mm-hmm. I think we get this pressure that we should be posting on Instagram. Like we're supposed to. And... And I do remember feeling that way in the last year or two. I'm like, well, I don't have anything for you to show you right now. So why would I post? Should I just make that up because <laughs> I'm supposed to? So the I algorithm just, loves it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that we put a lot of energy into the worries of those things when they're, for me, they're not worries anymore. They used to be worries, but mm. I don't put my energy into that anymore. Now, if you do want to work towards completing something um you know and you're feeling stuck in looking at these ideas or looking at these you know maybe studies or these exploratory things yeah i think that at some point you do kind of have to take the plunge and commit to something but Mm. i think that usually what works best for me is to commit to the next thing not to the big huge right right i think we put a lot of pressure on like okay, I've done these little things. I've done this explore. And now I want to do huge ones. For me, it does not work to go from like tiny little bubble idea to a big giant idea. I work better if I go to, well, what would be the next, you know, manageable study? Because in my mind, and this is just my brain tricking myself, everything is a study. It could be Mm -hmm. a 1.5 meter study, but it's Mm -hmm. a study, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think we, if we can kind of look at them like that then it's never finished anyway and they can evolve you know I think you the way you look at things from the way you talk about it is that everything's exploring there isn't actually a I need to get out of this exploring phase now and get into a completing phase it's always (laughs) (laughs) because I think that there's so much you learn when you scale and there's so much you learn um, by the challenges of scaling, by the challenges mm-hmm. of doing multiples. So scaling meaning mm-hmm. multiples, scaling meaning size, you know, proportion changes, you yeah. know, like your tools change, your what you do with your paint, how you move it around, like uh, everything changes. And so mm-hmm. to imagine that you do something small and then you can go, you know, big automatically doing this, doing it the same way isn't usually very realistic. So... Yeah. I like to look at it like, what's the next step that I could do? Now, one of the things that I did, um, I don't use a lot of loose canvas now, but I always have had to trick my mind into making that next step be not a finished product. And that's Mm -hmm. just me. You might be better at this, Beck. But I found that hard edges, canvas borders, or any stretched edges... It, it all of a sudden my body just starts compressing and it's like mm-hmm. it's it's a thing it's a finished product you know mm-hmm. and all of a sudden all these these loose qualities that I had about things change test on whether that is happening for you I think as an artist and yeah. figure out if there's 
you know, because I think we have these beliefs around things. Well, it's a stretch canvas. I don't want to waste a stretch canvas. And then your brain's yeah. ticking over like, well, how can I be resourceful on, you know, not wasting pain? And then you yeah, tick over yeah. and all of a sudden you become different in yeah. your process. I love that because we've been talking about, you know, trusting yourself, trusting the process and, and your experience, Michelle. And I love that it doesn't mean that although you do feel that level of trust now and you and you sort of flow through in your work, it doesn't mean that it's like trust 100% in every single way. Like you recognize yes. where the things are that catch you and you're like, okay, well, I'm just not going to push myself to do it in a specific way that doesn't help me be in that flow state. Because when we do harder things, you know, you're tired, mm-hmm. you're burnt, you're like, I mean, I always look at it like, well, what's the hardest thing I've done? Because You know, if the hardest thing I've done is a small piece, then a big one's really hard. But if the hardest thing I've done is a bigger piece, then the small things are easy. And so Mm -hmm. it's learning how to kind of trick your mind into thinking that something's not hard anymore as well, you know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And I like that. I like that. I'm also wondering, because we say that there's not one answer to to everything, but when I was describing that state of feeling like stuck in a lot of investigation or exploring and feeling anxiety around, oh, but where's the complete work? Where's, Where's the big idea, which is the other thing? Another thing that might be happening based on what you were describing it seems to me is that we can get a little stuck at that um that juncture point that you were talking about Mm -hmm. like it can be a a point where you're stagnating a little bit kind of getting caught at at a decision point where you're kind of afraid to take that Mm. path less traveled where you leap in like you say and go all in go weird let the freak flag fly so instead of like leaping into that you're kind of milling around at the at the crossroads going oh oh but I really think I should be doing this that's going to produce some work more quickly well then if you really think that why don't you try that but you don't because you've kind of got another part of you going oh but I'm really kind of interested in doing more exploring down that you know wooded path yeah. So that can be what's happening too. Yeah, absolutely. I think we do, you know, a lot of toe dipping, you know, especially mm-hmm. when we're like, oh, that looks really good, but let me just dance around it for a while. and Let me you try know, and keep all the pots on the, yeah, on the boil. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I think that the magic starts to happen when we can just jump in, trust that there's an internal calling. It's there for a reason. It's there to tell you something. And yeah. it's the fear, because if you look at it like, who's running the show? Is it the mm. fear or is it the belief when we dance around things? And I can think of, you know, every day I laugh at myself in the studio. And I'm like, just do the thing. Why are you dancing around it? Just do the <laughs> thing. Because, I mean, it just happens. So, like, I'll do these things and I'm I'm looking at it and I'm like, just just commit. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. It's easy to dance around it, you know? It's easy, yeah. but it's also the fear. It's the mm. fear that you're going to get it wrong. You know, it's the fear mm-hmm. that you're going to make a mistake. And and I laugh. The fear that there's no safety net as yeah, well, which exactly. is what we're talking about. But honestly, Be- what can happen? <laughs> you're not actually jumping off a cliff. You're not actually. No, you throw it away or you redo it. And I love the idea that actually from what we've talked about that promise the excitement of taking that leap is that the weird freaky amazing work can actually rise up to meet you at that point you've just got to get over the you've got to take that leap of trust yes so that this weird thing that you're kind of having a little calling to try but you're not sure it's like reaching your hand out if you don't if you don't yeah give it a chance to happen like you're saying in the yeah. in the studio if you don't even try that little thing then it never gets to it's never realized i don't know have its yeah it never gets to be realized it never gets to have its moment in the sun and for you to find out what it could be so yeah yeah, yeah. and then it never happens 
And then you're back to square one, which is and what? And then you're dancing around. <laughs> and you're dancing <laughs> the crossroads around. going, I don't know if that's going to work or not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so like I one of those Groundhog Day type movies. Totally. Trust that the art will meet you there. Mm. Trust that it will find its purpose. You know, we talk a lot about like, what is unearthing art and, and, and it's all connected who we are as people. And I really think that when we make these, you know, things with paint or, or papers or whatever we're doing in our practice, like trust that there's a reason why that's all going to connect. Trust mm-hmm. that, you know, I was making monoprints, was it earlier last year? Now I can't remember. It's been a blur. But I knew that I wasn't going to make monoprints something that I wanted to sell as a finished piece. A final thing. A final sell, thing. Yeah. I knew that. And yet I found myself doing these monoprints. And in the end, it does make sense. And I still am literally this week going back to look at those for something that they taught me. So I think that we have to get less attached to things performing in that moment for something. Yeah. You know, and and might look like a waste, but to who? Like, is there an internet police out there saying, (laughs) you know, you've had your quota of fun time. That's not useful. Like, I'm still referring to those monoprints and it's probably been a year and a half. I'm really digging this idea of giving yourself over a bit. You gave yourself over to those monoprints, not knowing like what was going to happen. But there's a richness there. The idea of giving yourself over to your art that the you said trusting that the art has its purpose the art has a a connected I mean reason is a strong word you know we all have different kind of the way we see the world and and beliefs but there are a lot of different ways that you can ascribe meaning and a lot of different levels like whether it's how you understand like you'd be the world on a quantum level or on a spiritual level or whatever it is but you can in whatever way is meaningful to you allow the art to come into being and and give it that opportunity as part of what we're doing as artists yeah and I think you know I look back to my old days at Nike and uh, as a creative who did not go to shoe school, I was like, what am I doing (laughs) at Nike? And I literally was there seven years and I wondered, what what is this doing for my art? I look back on that now and I'm like, oh, it makes perfect sense. There was so much usefulness in what I'm doing now. It doesn't always make sense why these callings and these things come into our life. You know, I don't Mm -hmm. think because, you know, we're in that moment. We don't have that 2020 vision from the past. But I just mm. do that now with all the art processes that come through. And mm. I do have a calling to do mono prints again. And I'm like, it's calling you. You better listen soon. So I yeah. think that's the trust, isn't it? It's the trust yeah. that the internal pull is mm. telling you something. It's It's either teaching you something that will be useful or it's giving you something that is in that moment. But I think that even teaching us something, whether we use it today or in a year, Mm. it it just adds to the toolkit that I think is so useful. So So let go and yes, and go with and follow the pull. Follow the pull. (laughs) Me and there. (laughs) And again, you don't have to ask, you know, the painting, like, what do you want to be? But I do have a bit of fun with that sometimes. And I look at it and I just look to see if there's any signs, you know, of Mm. the materials giving me clues. And um, and then I springboard from that. So try that maybe. Okay. So we know if we're walking past your studio and we hear you talking to your paintings (laughs) that you're totally fine and having a a great time. Totally fine. (laughs) Totally. I name them too. No, I'm kidding. No, it's it's all good. I mean, you got to do it your way, you know, but yeah. I just, I find that, yeah, we have a lot more fun, me and my paintings.